At the United Nations 75th Assembly this week, United States President Donald Trump asked United Nations to hold China accountable for depletion of world fisheries, harming the coral reefs and dumping plastics into the ocean. Even if you disagree with Mr. Trump's general style of engagement, you should have the desire to probe a little deeper into this matter. Yale School of Environment in August 2020 and also BBC had reported in depth about the subject. out in the middle of the South China Sea, this tiny speck of land we're about to land on is a Philippine military outpost. But the Philippine military's power barely extends beyond the island's reef. Less than a mile away, anchored on another reef, these boats we can see here are Chinese poachers. You can see smaller boats out on the reef, and behind them long yellow plumes of sandy debris. We've come here to investigate reports that under the protection of the Chinese Navy, poachers are plundering the reefs out here. So along with China's takeover of the South China Sea has come what the local Filipino fishermen here call environmental looters. People like these behind me here who've moved in and are stripping the reef of its coral and of its precious giant fans. The poachers anchor their boats to the reef and then rev their engines. I asked this man what they're doing. What are you looking for, I asked. We're looking for sea clams, he says. From up here, it's unclear exactly what they're doing. It's time to get in the water. As soon as we do, the extent of the devastation is revealed. Just a couple of years ago, before the poachers moved in, this was a thriving reef system. Now it is being torn to shreds by the poachers. Well, the scene underneath there is just unbelievable. They are literally destroying the lit reef wholesale with the, these boats. It's just like a... A desert. It's being turned to a desert underneath here. Now the poachers are in the water too, retrieving their prize. And this is it. A huge giant clam, perhaps a hundred years old. They gather them in a pile on the sea floor, ready to be hoisted onto their boats. On the international market, shells like these can sell for between one and two thousand dollars a pair. Last year on a reef close to here, Philippine police caught Chinese poachers with 500 giant sea turtles on board their boat. These animals are critically endangered and protected under UN convention. Beijing demanded Manila release the poachers saying the Philippines has severely violated China's sovereignty by illegally detaining Chinese fishing vessels and fishermen in waters off China's Nansha Islands. The characters on the stern of these Chinese fishing boats shows they come from the same port as the turtle poachers, Tanmen on China's Hainan Island. The crew shows no fear of us filming. They know no one is going to come and stop them. China is not only the world's biggest seafood exporter, the country's population also accounts for more than a third of all fish consumption worldwide. Having depleted the seas close to home, the Chinese fishing fleet has been sailing farther afield in recent years to exploit the waters of other countries, including those in West Africa and Latin America, where enforcement tends to be weaker as local governments lack the resources or inclination to police their waters. Most Chinese distant waterships are so large that they scoop up as many fish in one week as local boats from Senegal or Mexico might catch in a year. From the waters of North Korea to Mexico, incursions by Chinese fishing ships are becoming more frequent and aggressive. China has sought to extend its maritime reach through more traditional means too. 
The government has, for example, expanded its naval force faster than any other country while also dispatching at least a dozen advanced research vessels that prospect for minerals, oil, and other natural resources. Chinese fishing vessels are routinely cast by Western military analysts as a vanguard, civilian militia, that functions as a non-uniformed, unprofessional force without proper training and outside of the frameworks of international maritime law, the military rules of engagement, or the multilateral mechanisms set up to prevent unsafe incidents at sea. Nowhere is China's fishing fleet more omnipresent than in the South China Sea, which is among the most hotly contested regions in the world with competing historical, territorial and even moral claims from China, Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei, Taiwan, and Indonesia. Aside from fishing rights, the interests in these waters stem from a tangled morass of national pride, lucrative subsea oil and gas deposits, and a political desire for control over a region through which a third of the world's maritime trade flows. In the South China Sea, the Spratly Islands have attracted most attention as the Chinese government has built artificial islands on reefs and shoals in these waters, militarizing them with aircraft strips, harbors, and radar facilities. Chinese fishing boats bolster the effort by swarming the zone, crowding and intimidating potential competitors, as they did in 2018, suddenly dispatching more than 90 fishing ships to drop anchor within several miles of Philippines-held Thetu Island immediately after the Philippine government began modest upgrades on the island's infrastructure. In justifying its rights over the region, Beijing usually makes a so-called nine-dash line argument, which relies on maps of historic fishing grounds that feature a line made of nine dashes encompassing most of the South China Sea as belonging to China. Most legal scholars and historians say the nine-dash line argument has no basis under international law, and it was found to be invalid in a 2016 international court ruling. What China is doing is putting both hands behind its back and using its big belly to push you out, to dare you to hit first, said Huang Jing, former director of the Center on Asia and Globalization at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in Singapore. From the waters of North Korea to Mexico to Indonesia, incursions by Chinese fishing ships are becoming more frequent, brazen and aggressive. It hardly takes a great feat of imagination to picture how a seemingly civilian clash could rapidly escalate into a bigger military conflict. Such confrontations also raise humanitarian concerns about fishermen becoming collateral damage, and environmental questions about the government policies accelerating ocean depletion. But above all, the reach and repercussions of China's at-sea ambitions highlight anew that the real price of fish is rarely what appears on the menu. In a closing note, it may be prudent to realize even more than seafood is at stake in the present size and ambition of China's fishing fleet. Against the backdrop of China's larger geopolitical aspirations, the country's commercial fishermen often serve as de facto paramilitary personnel whose activities the Chinese government can frame as private actions. Under a civilian guise, this ostensibly private armada helps assert territorial domination, especially pushing back fishermen or governments that challenge China's sovereignty claims that encompass nearly all of the South China Sea. However, it is refreshing to note that the whole world is increasingly waking up to this challenge.